Uh, the message of my talk really is that uh, uh, in many situations, you might really prefer to do that signal processing at least partially in the mechanical domain using microelectromechanical systems, uh, a little like the system I'm showing in the background of the slide, which we'll get to later on. So the kind of analog signal processing functions I'm imagining are the kind of things that you might want to do to build a quantum network, a network uh, of nodes that you use to process and store information and links that you use to transmit that information over some distance. Now, if uh, that quantum network, if those nodes are far apart to sort of kilometer distances, you can think of this as some sort of communication network that has uh, informational security guaranteed by physical laws of nature. But uh, even if those nodes are actually physically rather close together, this is now uh, one of the most promising architectures for building uh, a scalable quantum information processing system uh, that uses a kind of hierarchical concept. Uh, and in particular, what we'll be thinking about is how you move the information from those nodes into those links. Now, uh, uh, I'm imagining uh, in this talk that those nodes uh, are going to be built from superconducting uh, circuits, some kind of superconducting qubit, the most coherent of which uh, are built from little Josephson junction circuit elements, qubits, sitting inside of uh, things which are legitimate three-dimensional volumetric microwave cavities. And there's some coupling between the qubit and the cavity field. So in particular, that uh, sets some physical constraints on uh, the way in which those nodes uh, can communicate. It's very natural to imagine that you'll communicate uh, using the microwave fields in the cavity, which naturally decay into or evolve into propagating modes running through transmission lines. Uh, but the most coherent version uh, of these qubits and quantum systems uh, are completely fixed frequency objects. The qubits, uh, you cannot tune in frequency, uh, and the cavities in order to build the most coherent version. Uh, and that means that uh, you have uh, an object which is spectrally narrow emission at some fixed frequency uh, in the microwave domain. So in particular, our cavities are made by humans, not by God. Uh, and so uh, they might intentionally or accidentally be at uh, different frequencies. And we will have, in principle, a spectral mismatch we need to overcome. We have to move information from one cavity into another cavity that might resonate at a different frequency. Even if they were at the same frequency, there's a kind of temporal mode mismatch that you have to deal with. In particular, if you can imagine creating a single photon in this microwave cavity at a particular instant in time using your superconducting qubit, that's naturally going to evolve into or decay into a propagating mode that runs through a coaxial cable that has a kind of decaying exponential envelope in time. Uh, now, uh, if on the other hand, you imagine that uh, you have a pulse containing some interesting quantum state of a microwave field racing through a cable, and that's incident on a cavity, and you'd like to know at some instant in the future that that uh, state is now completely contained in the cavity, uh, in order for that to be true, the cavity, uh, the mode should be uh, a rising exponential in time that cuts off suddenly. That's, uh, I think, just obviously true if you imagine running this emission process backwards in time. So you have a kind of temporal uh, mode mismatch that you'd like to overcome as well. And then finally, uh, for all of these uh, sorts of protocols where you want to work with propagating modes of electromagnetic fields, it's useful to have a kind of memory function, something uh, that hangs on to your propagating mode. Uh, in particular, uh, sort of the simplest, maybe quantum communication protocol, you can imagine uh, teleportation. If that's among propagating modes, then uh, you have three propagating modes, the one with the target state that you'd like to teleport, and a pair of propagating modes that you've arranged to be an entangled pair. Uh, if you combine on some kind of beam splitter object one half of your entangled pair with your target state and then make measurements, you get the two pieces of classical information you need to manipulate this half of the entangled state 
to now teleport your target state over into this mode. But while you are doing the measurement and the kind of classical information processing, well, your propagating mode uh, was probably screaming through some transmission line at two-thirds the speed of light. Uh, it's nice to be able to hang on to that. In the optical domain, you can sort of coil up a kilometer of optical fiber on your optical table. Uh, uh, and that at least uh, serves as a delay, a delay that you can choose how long the delay is on the fly. We'll think of that as a memory. And that provides you the kind of uh, timing functionality that you would want in a network. So uh, the question is then, what element, what object do we imagine we want to interpose between our two microwave cavities that's going to uh, allow us to do frequency convo uh, conversion, some kind of temporal mode shaping, and provide this delay or memory function. And uh, I've been thinking about that. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the broad community of superconducting, uh, uh, superconducting qubit physicists have also been thinking about that. In the past year or two, there have been seven high-profile papers uh, all addressing different aspects of this question. Can you uh, build a kind of uh, uh, memory for propagating microwave modes? Can you uh, shape the emission or absorption? Uh, can you convert between different frequencies? And I think all of these papers address either one or two of those uh, different functions. In general, uh, most of them are uh, limited to kind of planar uh, qubits, things built uh, as uh, circuits in planar cavities, and certainly uh, typically work with just a few photon signals. Um, and so all of, these, uh, all of this work basically uses uh, as the key element in the signal processing a Josephson junction. Uh, and that's because in order to do some signal processing uh, where you would like to hang on to every photon, you'd like the signal processing elements to be dissipationless or extremely low dissipation. Uh, and uh, well, if you want to make a linear time independent uh, processing element, you've made a filter. Anything else, you typically need some kind of nonlinear element. And the Josephson junction is the kind of low dissipation uh, nonlinear circuit element uh, for, uh, at electrical frequencies. What we've often said, and I may be guilty of even saying this, is, that, is the claim that this Josephson junction is unique. Uh, it is the only electrically nonlinear dissipationless circuit element. Uh, and it's true that the nonlinearity in these uh, Josephson junctions can be very strong, and that probably is unique. Uh, but it's not true that it's the only uh, nonlinear and low dissipation electrical circuit element available. In particular, uh, the physics of electricity coupled to mechanical motion uh, can be both uh, nonlinear uh, and low dissipation. Now, the nonlinearity is a fair bit weaker, uh, but that's going to be fine uh, for anything where the signal processing functions we can think of as being linear but time-dependent uh, elements. Uh, anytime you want really large dynamic range, and any time we would really like um, the information and uh, coded in a microwave field to then be hidden, to be really well isolated from any other microwave element, uh, these electromechanical circuit uh, elements are going to be extraordinarily useful. OK. So uh, I'll show you that you can uh, make a memory, that you can uh, do frequency conversion uh, and shape temporal envelopes using electromechanical structures all on a single device. So address the memory first. So when I talk about an electromechanical structure, uh, what I usually mean is uh, uh, what's uh, represented here on this slide. That is uh, a superconducting circuit. The light colored stuff is superconducting aluminum sitting on some insulating substrate. That's the blue stuff. Uh, the uh, spiral here, that's an inductor. And the disk up here is a capacitor, so just an LC circuit. And there's a transmission line that runs back and forth here uh, through which you can couple microwave energy into that LC circuit. So as represented uh, in uh, the circuit diagram. But the capacitor is funny. So the capacitor, uh, it's a parallel plate capacitor. You can see both plates, the upper plate, predominantly what makes up this disk, uh, and the lower plate, 
uh, you see only in these four spots where it sticks uh, out from underneath the top plate. Uh, and uh, the two metal layers that make up this capacitor come within about 50 nanometers of each other. Uh, uh, there's no material between them other than vacuum, and they don't touch. So if you do that, uh, then you can imagine uh, whacking that little uh, now suspended membrane, uh, and it's going to ring and ring at about 10 megahertz. The LC circuit here oscillates some, at some much higher frequency, about 7.5 gigahertz. So uh, this is now the kind of electromechanical structure that we'll use. Uh, in particular, uh, I'll now describe how uh, you uh, can make the electricity and the motion interact in a useful way. So. Uh, The essential uh, nonlinear interaction is just the following. If I impose a voltage between two plates of a capacitor, there's an attractive force between them. Uh, that attractive force depends on the square of the voltage. Uh, and you can imagine then that the associated force might lead to some mechanically compliant thing deflecting. And so there's an interaction, which is just this electrostatic force times the deflection of some uh, vibrational degree of freedom. I can write that interaction down in a quantum language. Why not? Uh, the uh, uh, voltage squared, I'll just think about the energy stored in the circuit. And so that's going to give me some uh, A dagger A in my Hamiltonian, telling me counting the number of microwave photons stored in that LC circuit. And then the deflection of my mechanical structure, uh, I'll write. Uh, uh, as the uh, phonon creation and annihilation operator summed up to give me some kind of uh, uh, position operator. And the scale for the nonlinearity here, though, is a bit weak. You can ask the question, if I were to deflect my mechanical oscillator by its zero point motion, uh, how much would I change the resonance frequency of the LC circuit? That's about 200 hertz. So yes, it's weak. But it's a kind of Kerr nonlinearity. Think about it this way. If I turn up the intensity of the microwave field that excites this circuit, I'm going to shift its resonance frequency. This is an intensity dependent uh, circuit resonance frequency. From the perspective of a microwave signal that might be reflected from this port, it's going to see an intensity dependent phase shift. And in that sense, this is my now low loss electrical nonlinearity. Now, uh, the scale for the nonlinearity isn't so big. Uh, it's about uh, here, about 200 hertz of frequency shift per zero point motion of the mechanical structure. Uh, and if I compare that, for example, to how rapidly microwave energy leaves this circuit, uh, it goes away about 1,000 times faster. Uh, so uh, from the perspective of something which is profoundly nonlinear, like using one microwave photon to switch one microwave photon, this structure is too weakly nonlinear. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we can use that nonlinearity. We can leverage it to create time-dependent uh, uh, linear interactions. So if we start with our interaction Hamiltonian and imagine that we uh, th uh, think about the susceptibility of our resonance circuit and now excite the circuit detuned from its resonance frequency by the mechanical oscillator's resonance frequency, then uh, it can work in new variables, which are just the fluctuations of the microwave field uh, away from this strong coherent drive. And in those new variables, I can now linearize the interaction in a rotating frame at this drive frequency. I see that I get an interaction, which is a, just a kind of pure conversion. It corresponds to the annihilation of microwave photons at the circuit's resonance frequency uh, uh, and then creation of excitations of mechanical motion, uh, and of course, the Hermitian conjugate. Uh, the motion of the mechanical oscillator will be converted into microwave fields that come out at the circuit's resonance frequency. And so this linear interaction is one that we can turn on and off. We can modulate by modulating the strength 
of this detuned dry field. And there's a single rate then that tells me how rapidly do I convert uh, information and energy in the propagating microwave fields into mechanical motion. Uh, that's this rate capital gamma, which is controlled uh, and is now much larger than my bare interaction rate uh, by essentially the square root of the number of photons uh, in my strong drive field. All right. So first thing we'll do with that interaction is make a kind of memory. Uh, so to imagine how that works, uh, imagine that uh, we have a propagating microwave field that's going to run through some transmission line. We're going to direct it at our mechanical oscillator and then extract whatever microwave field comes out and send it to some measurement system. The first thing we can imagine doing is just giving the mechanical oscillator a whack. It'll ring away, uh, completely decoupled from uh, the electrical circuit because we're not exciting it. If we pulse on some uh, microwave excitation detuned from the circuit's resonance frequency, we turn on the interaction between the mechanical motion and the resonance circuit. Uh, and we'll create a microwave pulse that comes out of the microwave circuit to our measurement system that encodes the amplitude and phase of the mechanical oscillator just before we turned on this pulse. So in that sense, it's a kind of readout of the sort of a pulsed readout or conversion of the state of the mechanical oscillator into a microwave field. And we can imagine running that backwards in time. Uh, so if we inject a rising exponential uh, pulse into our circuit in the presence of this control field, the amplitude and phase of that pulse will be written onto the amplitude and phase of the motion of our mechanical structure. And then uh, the, uh, in the absence of this control field, though, the microwave pulse would just reflect off our circuit and come back out and be measured immediately. So let's see if we can uh, see that uh, process. So what I'll show you here is the uh, microwave pulse that we inject at the circuit's resonance frequency, represented here as this kind of PowerPoint drawn wiggly line. Uh, uh, and then down here is actually what we measure in our, uh, with our microwave receiver uh, when we have the control field turned off. So our microwave pulse uh, travels down to our resonant circuit, bounces off, comes back out, measured immediately. Uh, and then when we turn our control field uh, on at a later time, we find nothing hiding in the mechanics, as we'd expect. If we turn that control field on, we can uh, see that the microwave pulse is completely absorbed. It's just been swallowed, eaten, as if we've sent it to a 50 ohm termination for the microwave engineers in the audience. Uh, but it's not absorbed. It's just hiding inside of the mechanical oscillator. And we can see that uh, uh, because when we turn the control field back on, out comes our microwave pulse again. Uh, let's see. Uh, to prepare me for later on in the talk, you'll notice that we've uh, changed the temporal envelope uh, from the uh, unhelpful uh, switch from a rising exponential to a decaying exponential. We might actually prefer to do the reverse. But in any case, we have changed the temporal envelope. Um, and this is what I mean by a kind of memory element. Uh, we can write a propagating field into mechanical motion, store it there for uh, a long period of time. I'll tell you how long in a moment. Uh, and then get it back, turn it back into a microwave field whenever we desire. So, uh, but uh, what about this uh, memory-like function uh, can be thought of as being remotely quantum? Go ahead. Uh, so it certainly does not want to be impedance matched in the sense that we are not trying to absorb any of that energy. Uh, you should think of it as uh, simply a far detuned uh, from the resonance frequency microwave field that nevertheless creates uh, an oscillating voltage across the capacitor. So it's pulse dependent or not? It's a general control field? Uh, so sorry, it, did you say? So the control field, is it specific? So for each incoming pulse, I have to find an optimal no, you have to find an optimal control field, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see that in, uh, a, uh, in detail uh, later on. Yes, this is a single mode. Uh, 
So if you want to catch this particular mode, you need to choose this control field to have exactly the right temporal envelope. So in that sense, I guess you would say it's impedance matched. I would think of this thing as the thing that I would be impedance matching. Uh, but yeah. Now the signal that's, that's going in there, is that at microwave or is that at the mechanical frequency? So it's at the microwave frequency, but it's uh, detuned from this control field by the mechanical oscillator's resonance frequency. If we oh, want to go back. But, but the control field is, I thought the control field was also detuned. From the from the um, electrical resonance by the mechanical. The control field is detuned from the electrical resonance by the mechanical oscillator's right. resonance frequency. The thing we'd like to catch, the signal field, that's at the circuit's resonance frequency. Okay. Um, right. Okay. I, okay. And the information that's encoded, it's encoded in in changes in the phase of the uh, amplitude of, of and the phase are both. Field, which is the control field is also a, a sensing field. It's a measuring. Field as well as being a control field. That's right. Because nothing happens. I mean, the reason you call it a control field is because nothing happens uh, to the mechanical motion unless you've got the control field on. The mechanical motion and the uh, uh, energy in the electrical circuit are, uh, to a fantastic approximation, completely decoupled when this is turned off. Right. Uh, and so uh, maybe just to think uh, a little bit kind of uh, classically about the interaction, the force is proportional to the square of the voltage. So if I turn on this detuned microwave field, uh, the uh, uh, force being proportional to the power is either at DC at some static frequency, uh, much lower than the mechanical oscillator's resonance frequency, or up at the square of this frequency, which is somewhere at 14 gigahertz, much, much faster than the mechanical oscillator's resonance frequency. It's when we have two tones present that they beat against each other and there's a force, like a classical you know, uh, power going up and down, uh, and therefore leading to a force oscillating at the mechanical oscillator's resonance frequency. And it just happens to be that the phase of uh, that force uh, uh, and the modulation uh, of this tone by mechanical motion happen to add up 180 degrees out of phase. So uh, arranged correctly, it looks like you absorb this microwave pulse. In fact, you just transferred into the state of the mechanics. Does the sign of the matter? It does rather drastically. Uh, and instead of getting this pure uh, conversion or beam splitter like interaction, you get the kind of parametric down conversion instead. Uh, you create uh, phonons and photons in pairs. And uh, I won't talk about it today or regrettably tomorrow, but we do have a uh, paper in science about uh, creating entanglement between microwave pulses and mechanical motion that way. So, thanks for asking, actually. That was, uh, uh, OK. So very good. What about that can we think of as being kind of remotely relevant uh, to a quantum signal? Well, it's certainly true that a 10 megahertz mechanical oscillator, even shivering inside of a dilution refrigerator, which all of the science has done at uh, 10 or 20 milladegrees above absolute zero, uh, uh, that uh, that will have something like 40 thermal excitations uh, on average. And that uh, sounds pretty classical. But in the end, the game we have to play is simply to ensure that our mechanical oscillator is much more strongly coupled to the vacuum of electromagnetism at microwave frequencies than it is to its own thermal environment. Uh, simply, can we make this rate gamma big enough? And that uh, can be expressed as a cooperativity parameter. Have we made this uh, propagating field mechanical motion interconversion rate big compared to this kind of quantum decoherence rate? And if we have, that's sort of the large cooperativity regime. And in fact, uh, we can, uh, in these systems, get cooperativities of well over uh, 100. And uh, the other aspect, the other thing you would care about is sort of what's the uh, how long can you store the information compared to how long does it take you to read and write? That's basically the delay times bandwidth product of your memory. And uh, for us uh, right now, that's somewhere around 100. Uh, basically, the quantum decoherence rate, that's our storage. Uh, that sort of limits our storage time. And then the fastest we can imagine moving information from here out to here is set by this electrical circuit decay rate. Uh, and with that, we've done this sort of state transfer and the two-mode entanglement uh, that you uh, thoughtfully allowed me to advertise. Uh, OK. So uh, 
And I can show you that, for example, like, it, even with these kind of classical coherent fields, what about this is kind of quantum? Uh, so in particular, uh, this is uh, the pulse we measure coming out of our microwave measurement system, sampled uh, at some rate where we've just scribbled in the temporal envelope. We can apply uh, an optimal filter to that to extract the amplitude and phase, or if you prefer, the two quadrature amplitudes. Uh, do it once, I get one point in uh, phase space. Repeat that process uh, 2,000 times, I get 2,000 points in phase space. And uh, essentially, one way to represent the quantum scale here is simply to say that uh, if uh, there were absolutely no noise in our measurement system or in our memory or anything else, uh, then two-thirds of these data points would fall inside of that uh, little blue circle. In fact, two-thirds of them fall inside of the somewhat larger black circle. And that's essentially just because of the inefficiency uh, of our measurement system. It's about 50% efficient. So none of that's due to the thermal excitation of the mechanical oscillator? So uh, I guess a little bit is. We can resolve a small amount of that. But predominantly, this is uh, the inefficiency of the measurement system. Uh, we, so in this process, we gain something like two-tenths of uh, a phonon from the environment in this particular data set. Uh, so what's the, um, uh, the mean number of phonons that are um, uh, stored from the microwave pulse when you do this, for example, in this case? So uh, the coherent field here uh, is maybe sort of uh, 10 photons-ish. Okay, and so, so you store so 10 phonons so in, in spite a... Of the ten, in, in, but if you've got tens of thermal phonons, if I remember correctly. Well, so. So how does that work? <laughs> uh, I'll show in a moment that uh, while you're transferring out the, uh, uh, while you're transferring in a coherent field from the microwave domain, at the same time you're transferring out the state of the mechanics into a propagating microwave field. You literally take the entropy out of the mechanical oscillator uh, and uh, at the same time that you're reading in uh, the microwave field, it's really is a swap. You simply exchange uh, the state of the microwave field for the state of the mechanical oscillator. So in fact, uh, even if you started with 1,000 phonons in principle, uh, you would simply, uh, to the degree that you had did a perfect job with uh, temporal mode matching and so on, uh, you would suffer nothing from that. Uh -huh. So all that is going into the propagating microwave field. So in a sense, you've I hesitate to use the word cooled. No, you have cooled. You've absolutely cooled. There's no reason to hesitate. The, no, I, uh, uh, you know, were this a couple of years ago, I would be standing in front of you. In fact, I guess I will do this tomorrow, boasting about the fact that we'd cooled our mechanical oscillators down to something much less than one thermal excitation. Uh, but this is now using it in a protocol. Well, usually when you cool something, there's some dissipation mechanisms. There is. So, what's, uh, so the dissipation, what's the it's purely this. It's purely the coupling of the microwave circuit to a propagating microwave field. Uh, if you think about it, uh, in a staccato sense, you can imagine that I've transferred in a completely coherent, no dissipation way, the state of the mechanical oscillator into this circuit. And then the circuit decays to a propagating microwave field that runs away and doesn't come back. Uh, the kind of partner to that is the incident microwave field, which is being transferred into the, into the mechanical oscillator at the same time. Oh, I'm going backwards. Don't want to do that. <laughs> It's like, wait a minute, no, no, I, I think I talked about all of this before. All right, very good. There we are. Uh, good. Uh, so uh, something that uh, Bill hasn't yet asked me, uh, but uh, he uh, was, uh, I, I suspect uh, someone might ask is, OK, fine. Uh, so you can see the quantum noise scale. It's not very big compared to all of the noise. But these are coherent fields. Uh, in a quantum optics sense, they have an extraordinarily classical character to them. Can you imagine catching something which is a genuinely quantum state? Use your qubit in a superposition of ground and excited states, turn it into a superposition of zero and one photon, propagating through a cable, and catch that in a mechanical oscillator. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but in particular, uh, we are uh, 
uh, gearing up to do that. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So, uh, in so the distinction uh, that needs to be made is basically between those states of a microwave field which have Gaussian statistics and those which have genuinely non-Gaussian statistics. Our electromechanical structure too linear to access non-Gaussian states. Uh, we can use qubits to do that, though. If we imagine we want to do this, catch uh, a flying qubit in our mechanical oscillator, what do we need to do? Well, we have to make our qubit create a microwave pulse that contains, for example, in this case, just one photon. Uh, so our notion for doing that uh, is to use uh, our three-dimensional uh, transmon qubit, which we can think of as a two-level system, either in its ground state or excited state, and a cavity with either zero photons or one photon. Uh, I'll draw a, a diagram with energy as a function of nothing, uh, uh, as is common in the AMO world. Uh, and uh, imagine that I start in this uh, zero photon qubit in the ground state, uh, and then I make some transition up to a uh, qubit in the excited state, one photon in the cavity. And at that point, that state will spontaneously decay, if we've arranged it correctly, into emitting a single microwave photon out through this port. Uh, and so this is the protocol that we'll run. We'll have uh, uh, start in qubit ground state, zero photons, pulse on uh, a pi pulse. This is actually a two photon transition, sort of uh, otherwise parity forbidden. Uh, so uh, the uh, double arrow is indicating that. Uh, end up in the cavity in the excited state, one, uh, sorry, the qubit in the excited state, one photon in the cavity. And all the time, the cavity mode is constantly evolving into our propagating field. So if we can put one photon in the cavity, uh, a moment later, we'll have one photon in a uh, microwave field coming out in a decaying exponential pulse. Fixed frequency, 5.8 gigahertz, and narrow band, about 100 kilohertz. So just to show you that we can do that, uh, we'll run this protocol. Uh, and if uh, we leave out this pulse, uh, we measure basically vacuum of our me measurement system. If we apply our uh, single, uh, our pi pulse, then uh, we measure the variance of that, and then we can plot the extra variance that we get whenever we uh, have our pi pulse versus not having our pi pulse. And that shows you the temporal envelope, that sort of decaying exponential temporal envelope. You can see energy coming out, basically looks like noise, uh, when we pulse on, uh, when we uh, pulse the G0 E1 transition. Say again? Sorry. How is this 100 uh, So this one might be more like 300. I think. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind, uh, so I'm plotting the energy here. So at least there's a factor of two uh, between maybe uh, the field decay rate and the energy decay rate. Uh, that by itself just shows you that whenever I turn on this pi pulse, I get some noise. I can uh, show you it's a little more interesting than that. Uh, we can again make an optimal filter, extract using a microwave measurement system one quadrature of the microwave field, uh, and then plot that as a histogram uh, in the green compare that to the histogram of the vacuum in black, and then ask with what fidelity we make a single photon. Uh, and uh, well, uh, not that faithfully, except that the predominant uh, uh, in, uh, infidelity is just the measurement inefficiency. Actually, if we uh, correct for that, our preparation fidelity is about 90%. OK, but now imagine that we actually wanted to do this. We wanted to catch this pulse, turn it into mechanical motion. We would have uh, to build an electromechanical structure with its resonance frequency exactly at 5.8 gigahertz. Can't get that wrong. Uh, and uh, we have to catch now not a rising exponential pulse, but a decaying exponential pulse. So you have to overcome both the spectral mode mismatch and the temporal mode mismatch. So to do that, uh, we've built a new type of electromechanical device. Uh, uh, looks like the previous, but it has some added features. Uh, again, it's a spiral inductor, uh, one of these vacuum gap uh, capacitors. Uh, but there's an additional electrode. So if we zoom in on that capacitor, again, we see the top plate 
And the bottom plate, top plate, is what you see mostly. It's got all little holes in a circle around it, stuck to the substrate. Uh, but it's kind of buckled or blistered up in the middle. Uh, and underneath is not one electrode, but two. Uh, one electrode is the same sort of disk here that runs out to some inductor forming our LC circuit, like so. But there's a second electrode coming out this way that's sitting underneath our uh, top plate. It's sitting in some kind of, uh, so basically an annulus here running around that we can impose a static voltage. And that static voltage uh, allows us to attract the top plate towards the bottom plate in a static way, and thereby tune the resonance frequency uh, of our LC circuit. I guess, uh, let's see, the dents you see in here uh, or the structure you see in the top plate come from the fabrication process. They kind of show you the, where the bottom electrodes are and what shape they have. Uh, and we've put some false color on there to sort of uh, highlight that a little bit. Uh, it's also the color scale is chosen uh, 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 by my students who like to refer to this as the Colorado flag device. Uh, though when I showed it to Rob Sholkoff a few months ago, he called it the quantum hubcap. Uh, <laughs> all right. So if we measure the resonance frequency of this LC circuit just as we adjust the static potential, we can tune the resonance frequency of the LC circuit, you can see, over uh, a little more than 2 gigahertz. Uh, and uh, that's great. Uh, I wish it were quite that nice that we get a full 2 gigahertz of tunability. It's not quite that good. And to illustrate that, I'll show you simultaneously the resonance frequency of the electrical circuit and of the mechanical oscillator. Uh, and you can see uh, that the resonance frequency of the mechanical oscillator uh, sort of falls off a cliff here. Now, if you've ever thought about uh, attracting two metal plates to each other, one held back by a spring, uh, you probably know that there's an instability, a collapse just from that uh, alone. That's not what's happening here. These are two, uh, so if you look, the electrode to which we're applying the static voltage is really recessed a long way back. Uh, the attraction is between these two electrodes. Uh, and uh, fairly clearly, it's the Casimir force. It's supposed to be there, uh, uh, frustrating as it is. Uh, one thing I can say, and I have uh, no story about what I'm going to measure with it, this is now the Casimir force measured between metal plates that are between 50 and 25 nanometers separated. That's an extraordinarily close approach between two metal surfaces compared to what's usually measured. And in particular, systematic effects like maybe there's some little patch potentials on my metal plates are now much smaller than the Casimir force in comparison. That's a sort of a, uh, an aside, though. It takes me away from my main message, uh, which is about uh, now dealing with the temporal mode mismatch. So again, I showed you earlier that we were able to take a rising exponential pulse, uh, which uh, we measure uh, bouncing off our electromechanical system uh, in the absence of a control field. When we turn on a control field, we can absorb that pulse. Uh, and then hiding inside of the mechanics, we can turn our control field back on, and there's our pulse again. Uh, but uh, that's done exactly the time reverse of the thing we wanted. We've turned a rising exponential pulse into a decaying exponential. And uh, so the question that was asked earlier, yeah, uh, we've got to shape this pulse uh, to catch, say, for example, a decaying exponential. If we try to do that with our square-shaped uh, pulse, you can see that at early times, we're kind of undercoupled. We're transferring our microwave field into mechanics too slowly, so most of it is bouncing off right back at us. And then we go and sort of overshoot. Uh, we uh, invert the phase 180 degrees, and now we're transferring too rapidly. The microwave field is going right into the mechanics and right back out again. Uh, we've got to balance those two processes. Uh, so to do that, well, you can imagine that all we want to do is arrange for the, uh, the microwave field, uh, which reflects off our structure, to vanish, or at least in some average sense vanish. And the reflected field is composed of a kind of prompt reflection and some piece that's processed by the mechanic, some piece that's you know, been stored in mechanical motion, and now it's being turned back into a microwave field. If we can arrange for those to, to uh, uh, have perfect destructive interference between them, then the reflected field will vanish. Uh, and while the kind of process piece, that depends on the state of the mechanics now, fortunately, the state of the mechanics now 
depends on the state that the microwave, incident microwave field had at an earlier time. And so uh, you can uh, arrange to uh, adjust the strength of your detuned coherent drive just so that uh, the incident microwave field is absorbed in the mechanics. And if you say to me, but I can't know the state of the mechanics at the beginning of the process, you're right. And that's how you understand that I'm also reading out the state of the mechanics at the same time. So uh, now with the decaying exponential pulse, you can't do a perfect job uh, catching that simply because you would have to turn on, you would have to couple, have infinitely strong coupling between the uh, microwaves and mechanics. But you can catch about 94% of the energy, and that's what you can see here. And uh, this is my sort of attempt to PowerPoint sketch uh, what that uh, pulse, uh, uh, sort of optimally shaped pulse would look like. And then here, we've just turned our control field back on uh, to show that indeed we get most of the energy back. Uh, now there's no magic here. Uh, the ability to reverse the uh, timing to take a decaying exponential pulse and turn it back into a decaying exponential pulse at a later time to catch the decaying exponential pulse in the first place simply requires that the uh, spectral width of that pulse be rather narrow in comparison to the very strongest coupling rate we can get to. So long as that's true, then we're able to efficiently capture uh, this decaying pulse. Now, uh, getting the decaying exponential pulse back again seems a bit dull. Let's do something slightly more interesting than that. Let's make it a nicely shaped Gaussian. Uh, go ahead. So what's, what's the limitation? If, if I go in and try to figure out theoretically what the limitation of that is. So uh, you mean why is? Uh, Can I get it to 98, 99? I mean, I mean, in the end, there, there has to be a limitation because of a few things. But what is the limitation? Well, the bandwidth. So th that's just right. Uh, the, uh, in the end, so let's say it this way. Uh, can, this is an absolutely calculable quantity. If you say, I know the bandwidth of this pulse, and I know the fastest rate that uh, I can achieve between coupling energy from the propagating microwave fields to the mechanical motion, uh, uh, you will calculate uh, precisely uh, uh, a number that, in fact, is basically what you measure. And that more or less, the, the, the important quantity is just this, the ratio of the bandwidth of this pulse to the largest uh, bandwidth of transfer rate that you can achieve. But then uh, the decay of the mechanical as well. So uh, the uh, mechanical oscillator will, uh, yes. So uh, the mechanical oscillator uh, will uh, decay to uh, its environment, or more to the point, uh, the environment will unhelpfully contribute phonons you didn't want. Uh, and uh, that's true. Uh, that scale is the less uh, troublesome uh, problem for us. So uh, let's see. Uh, I was just about to boast about the fact that you can now make, uh, also uh, you could make a rising exponential pulse, which is just the time reverse, but uh, let's do something slightly more fun, let's just show you that I can make a very nice Gaussian pulse as well. Okay, so uh, we are wrapping up, I promise. Uh, so the uh, final thing uh, that we have to deal with is maybe, uh, so with this structure, we could certainly catch a microwave pulse made from a fixed frequency object where we did not manage to fabricate two resonance circuits uh, with exactly the same resonance frequency. We can tune one into resonance with the other, at least over some range. Uh, but uh, what if we now want to link two different elements at two different frequencies? Uh, so I'll show you that now, uh, the sort of dynamic frequency conversion that's possible in devices like this. So uh, basic idea is that we can begin with a large static voltage uh, tuning our resonant circuit down to some lower resonant frequency uh, uh, designed to catch a decaying exponential pulse, uh, convert that into mechanical motion, uh, and then turn off this uh, coupling between the microwave field uh, and the uh, mechanical motion. And then 
the information is completely hidden from any microwave degree of freedom. It's just hiding inside of that mechanics, completely decoupled from the resonant circuit. At that point, we can turn off our uh, coupling uh, to the mechanical motion and change the DC voltage, say rapidly move it to some much lower static potential, shifting our resonance frequency kind of as much as uh, we desire within some range. And at that point, turning back on uh, our coupling field uh, shaped, for example, to emit uh, something more uh, useful like a, like a Gaussian pulse. And uh, so how do you represent uh, an experiment like that? We struggled with that for a while. You have to show both the spectral content and the temporal content in the signal. Uh, we've settled on uh, the Wigner-Ville representation. Uh, so basically, it's a two-dimensional function of time and frequency. Uh, if you integrate out the time axis, you get the power spectral density in your, or the power spectrum in your microwave pulse. If you integrate out the frequency uh, information, you get uh, the temporal envelope. And yes, it's intimately related to the Wigner function of quantum mechanics. It's just that the negative bits here have nothing to do with you know, kind of profoundly quantum states. Uh, the, uh, so this is what we see uh, if we inject a decaying exponential pulse and don't attempt to convert it into uh, a diff, catch it in the mechanics and convert it to a microwave pulse at a different frequency. If we do that, then uh, we can look at the uh, emission now, which is that now at some very different frequency and comes out with our nice Gaussian temporal envelope. We can move the information uh, something like 60 microseconds in time uh, and over uh, 250 megahertz in frequency. And uh, this is some a demonstration using something like a, uh, maybe 100,000 or a million microwave photons in that pulse. It's extraordinarily linear. Uh, also works uh, with the same kind of coherent fields, but now tuned down to the point they have 10 or 100 uh, microwave photons. So here I'm showing uh, in black uh, what we measure as vacuum in our measurement system, kind of represented in one of these phase space plots. Uh, if we try to catch and uh, store and then release a coherent field uh, in uh, the blue data with, say, about 10 photons in the coherent field or about 100 photons in red, uh, we add noise that's substantially less than one quantum. So uh, what uh, I'm uh, summing up to is that these electromechanical structures really enable you to couple 3D transmon qubits. Uh, you can move information from here to there in a deterministic way. At least that is the functionality I've showed you. Whether or not the community of people who work with those end up adopting my technology, uh, I don't know. But uh, one thing that we have to deal with is that one of the things that we're trying to do in my group is move information from the microwave to optical domain. We've built a kind of electro-optic converter that's designed to work in the quantum domain. Uh, but uh, again, it's a kind of fixed, fixed frequency object that uh, works in some narrow bandwidth. And we can probably only predict that frequency within about 50 megahertz. So some functionality like this is really necessary for us. All right, so what I've shown you is that uh, in a single electromechanical device, there's uh, a tunable memory, uh, a temporal mode shaping function, uh, and dynamic frequency conversion. Uh, it works with single photon sensitivity, uh, but million photons worth of linearity. And in that sense, uh, it's really designed to couple 3D transmon qubits to each other uh, uh, or to our electro-opto converters. I'll just uh, put up my acknowledgments and take your questions. So uh, I think the, uh, at the moment, if we say, I would like to make a smaller mechanical oscillator, that means making a smaller capacitor. 
Uh, and uh, the uh, desire is basically to make uh, a resonant structure where you have an inductor capacitor resonant circuit uh, that resonates at some useful frequency to you that's sort of chosen by other technology. Uh, the uh, impedance of the capacitor at that frequency, uh, uh, it can be uh, 50 ohms, it can be 100 ohms, it might be up to a kilo ohm. As you get larger than that, uh, you cannot build an inductor, uh, or maybe I won't say cannot, but uh, 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 Maxwell's equations will not be fooled forever. Uh, it's very hard to make a 100 kilo ohm or 10 kilo ohm impedance inductor. And so uh, in order that the capacitance in our circuit is predominantly the electromechanical capacitance, uh, the, we are ultimately going to be limited by how uh, high an impedance inductor we can make. Uh, and as long as you're going to work with metals that you kind of coil up on a surface and don't use Joseph injunctions and so on, a kilo ohm is a reasonable limit. We're not that far from that right now. Uh, I think these are, I think in this structure it's maybe 700 ohms on resonance. Uh, so uh, maybe only a factor of three or so uh, pushing up in, uh, so as long as I'm willing to trade away some of my coupling strength, I can make a higher frequency mechanical oscillator, uh, but I'm going to lose the coupling to electromagnetism. It's small, I don't want to make it too much smaller. What controls the tension? Do you have any way of? The tension is actually critically important uh, in these structures. In fact, they're designed from, the, from birth to use tension in a very particular way. Uh, the aluminum uh, is annealed uh, at ambient temperature, so it's basically the, uh, not under tension or compression at ambient temperature or a little bit above where you anneal. Uh, we then cool down. The aluminum shrinks a lot more than the sapphire it's sitting on, and that's important because actually that's what pulls it to within about 50 nanometers of the base electrode. Uh, and uh, the shape uh, is actually carefully chosen to get us to about 50 nanometers and then not touch. Uh, so tension is cri uh, critically important. It's useful to us because for our perspective, tension is just a way uh, to get a kind of free increase in Q. Uh, rather than build something which would resonate at 10 megahertz uh, where the spring would be purely the kind of flexural tension, uh, the uh, flexural stiffness in the structure, uh, we take something which would have a lower resonance frequency and use tension to pull it up uh, Dissipation seems independent of tension or maybe even gets a bit better under tension. So to the degree that we make the resonance frequency higher, we get a higher Q. But you don't have like any uh, No, there's no like straining or anything. It's not, it's not something that's in situ adjustable except to the degree that this uh, DC electrode applies tension. But that's not really an independently tunable thing. Let's see, I'm you know, going to try to see if we can go back to the relevant picture here. I guess it's so, the where you put the ground. Too. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, of course, draw it as if I could impose uh, a static potential, and there was no degree of freedom in that circuit. But as you well know, uh, there would be. Uh, we work rather hard to filter that line. And if you just look up in this corner here, you can see something which looks a little like a kind of a corner of a waffle. What that is is a whole bunch of, uh, it's actually gigantic on the scale. Uh, it's a whole bunch of air bridges of uh, uh, aluminum leaping over uh, 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 aluminum, making bunches and bunches of capacitors in parallel. Uh, and that makes uh, a pretty big on-chip capacitor. And then immediately off-chip, there's additional capacitance uh, and so on. So we can make a very low impedance environment. And we really don't lose <coughs> microwave power out this line. Does, it have, does this filter have an inductor, too? Or is it just a yeah, it has an inductor as well. Uh, but the primary win is really by having a lot of on-chip capacitance. Uh, you mentioned one of the problems uh, of frequency mismatch, between Yeah. Um, maybe I missed. Um, can you actually use your device uh, by uh, 
uh, by coming with a different tune for the retrieve pulse so that you can up convert or down convert when you're actually retrieving the full time. So all of the information uh, is going to come in and out of the device close to the circuit's resonance frequency. So, uh, but, if, but if I um, retrieve it with a different frequency, right. so the control, the, the control field uh, can be at a different frequency. That's true, but again, uh, the, uh, all, of, all that that's really going to accomplish for you, yes, uh, in principle, uh, you can uh, tune a small amount that way, but you're really limited by the bandwidth of the electrical circuit, uh, which is rather too narrow band. Uh, so for example, if you were uh, you know, detuned by 30 line widths uh, from your electrical circuit, then uh, the efficiency of this process is going to be so horrendously low that uh, you, will be, you will be deeply disappointed. Uh, Not off of this capacitor very well, uh, or at least no one will stop me uh, from doing that. Uh, but uh, what we know from other experiments in the lab, as you might expect, is that it's not very much light to break the superconductivity. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, imagine you could do the following thing. Imagine, just for the sake of argument, that I could take my little static electrode and I could tug uh, on that structure uh, at twice the resonance frequency of the LC circuit. Uh, I, I'm just anticipating where this question might be uh, motivated. Then I would be changing the resonance frequency of that LC circuit at twice its resonance frequency. That's a parametric process. But in a very real sense, uh, this is a kind of dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, I'm actually stretching predominantly the static Casimir effect. That's the spring constant I'm working against. I'm not shaking a photon out of some condensed matter analogy to vacuum. That's really the vacuum. Uh, and if you could do that, uh, you could imagine making uh, a measurement of the temperature of the radiation you emitted and the acceleration of that top plate and seeing that they would be related by big G. That would be a deeply exciting thing to do. Uh, and uh, technically, it seems extraordinarily difficult. Um, if that was the question you were kind of uh, getting up to asking, uh, we have asked ourselves the same question. Uh, uh, so uh, Vlad, uh, there are other devices in the lab which uh, interact better with light. We have devices that have metal in some regions, uh, that is some mechanical structures that have metal in some regions, and very low loss dielectric in others. Uh, and devices like that might be the right way to, uh, to do that. So could you go over more slowly how Big G got into this? <laughs> uh, so no, because I probably am wrong. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the risk. Uh, no, the, um, so my uh, sense is if I uh, have a mirror that is accelerating, uh, yeah. uh, that the uh, vacuum uh, of electromagnetism that is going to interact with that accelerating mirror uh, is going to be kind of up-converted to real photons. And I think the... So uh, some sort of an unruh? Unruh Davies uh, effect uh, is basically that acceleration uh, uh, the, uh, is related to the temperature of that radiation uh, in the kind of Hawking radiation sense. And in that sense, big G appears. Uh, the, uh, you don't have to do quite that well when you have a resonant circuit, because basically you get to kind of reprocess the same photon uh, by the Q of the cavity. So you get a kind of a Q enhancement. Okay, well at 4 o'clock today and 21.15 CSS, we will be meeting, Conrad will be meeting with uh, grad students and postdocs, and let's thank Conrad.